and I also nodded the entire time I read what she sent uh, for me to read as an introduction to her video. Right. Right. Gotcha. You ready? I need to stall. Good. <laughs> so from Nova. I have a few choice words about Libby Wheeler. <laughs> she is daring. She is t a talented writer and a talented observer. And it's this astute way of seeing teens as the authentic and multifaceted humans they are that comes through so distinctly in her pages. Libby and I spent an intense and very prolific semester together working on her creative thesis, Getting Away, a collection of short stories about the teens who do, and on so much more. Even though six months have passed and I am writing these introductory words from a distance, I am still the reader she held in the palm of her hand. I keep thinking of how she had me laughing and nodding and jumping in surprise and awe and fear and delight. She tells stories that ache, that bite, that take us deep into the shocking wilds of her imagination and, as she may well remember, are at times so moving they make her advisor cry. The story she will read tonight won the In a Nutshell Short Story Award here at BCFA and it's easy to see why. In tight, skillfully moving pieces, it deepens and turns and resonates and, as always, surprises. Just watch it turn. This story is one voice among many. That's one of Libby's great talents, how her work can speak so authentically through a number of voices and each one feels as if she knows it as well as her own. Please welcome Libby Wheeler, reading from Not A Love Story. <laughs> workshop leaders for helping me see, particularly Amy, who saw most of all, to David, a fellow fixer, and all the reasons we are the way we are, to Amanda, a truth teller who stopped me from lying to myself, to Tom, who taught me to pull all my pieces back together again, and Nova, who saw my soul and called it beautiful, so I'm going to try to be. Um, to the guardians for inviting me in to my rights for never letting me go, to my dear Rhonda, my sister by fate, to my mom for possibilities, to my dad for letting me tend to him, to Mary, DJ, and Monica for tending to everything I didn't, and Ross, Dewey, and Matthew, my loves, thank you for tending to me as I went about the business of unburying. All right, now the love story. <laughs> okay. All right, so Romeo and Juliet is not a love story. It's a tragedy, I should know. I'm a plague. Everyone wants me to get away with killing people. A plague on both your houses. Shakespeare made Mercutio say it while he's dying, and it isn't said to the guy who stabbed him. Nope. He says it to his buddy, Romeo, and it may seem like a crappy thing to say to your best friend when you're dying, but trust me, Romeo deserves it. He gets away with it, too. He just leaves town, which he thinks is torture, but he had it easy because I know what it's like to stay. I wrote an essay about it for English. I told Mr. Thompson, everyone thinks Romeo and Juliet is some big love story, but it's not. It's like a public service announcement about what happens when people stop paying attention. They're idiots, Romeo and Juliet. They deserve a plague because it would be one thing if they just took their own lives. A lot of innocent people die in that plague. Even Tybalt, a legit asshole, did really deserve to die. <laughs> but he did, and Paris, he died, he actually thought Juliet loved him. I mean, she sure as hell didn't tell him otherwise. And then there's Romeo's mom. I bet she forgot about Romeo's mom. I bet she forgot she even died. It's tucked in at the end when Paris is dead and Romeo is dead and Juliet is dead, Tybalt too. And it's a bloodbath in the vault, so Romeo's mom only gets a brief mention by her husband, Lord Montague. He's all like, what the hell's going on here? Tonight can't get any worse. My wife just died. What? My son too? Stop. <laughs> See, you'll miss it, that whole dead mom thing, if you aren't paying attention. I was paying attention. I always pay attention now. Romeo's mom died because her son fell in love. 
and he was exiled, and maybe she died from a broken heart, or maybe she killed herself, but either way, Romeo killed her. He was so wrapped up in Juliet and himself that he was not paying attention. I always pay attention now, ever since I delivered a plague myself. I'm fucking Romeo. I wrote all that in the essay, too. I'm probably gonna call the guidance counselor again, but Mr. Thompson shouldn't ask questions about stuff we read if he doesn't really want to hear the answers. Stick to multiple choice. Make it more like math. What did Mr. Thompson expect? I mean, really, a play like that? A plague on both your houses, Mercutio says. Only it isn't Mercutio who says it in class. It's Devin with a Y Miller, who claimed the role of Mercutio before everything happened. Unless you've got a problem with girls playing guy roles, Mr. Thompson. So when she says Mercutio's line, it's Devin Miller minus the zest that used to make her Devin Miller. We're star-crossed, Devin and me, but we are not lovers, never lovers. Every emotion is gone when she recites a plague on both your houses. She avoids looking at me afterward, and I can feel the whole class not looking at me, not looking at me, but wanting to. Romeo didn't mean to kill anyone, but it is his fault. Just like it's my fault. I'm a tragedy. I'm a plague. I know it's true, and they're going to make sure I get away with it. You see, it's bad enough that I killed my own mother. It's worse watching my dad try to be okay with it, because the walls are thin, and I can hear him even when he lowers his voice. He shushes Caitlin as she says, I miss mommy. When he tucks her in at night, shh, he says, we all miss her. He lowers his voice like if I don't hear that they miss her, somehow I'll feel better. But I'm over slamming my fists in the walls. I'm past sobbing and begging for God to change things that can't be changed. I'm with Ethel living with it part, punching myself inside where no one can see. I wish Dad would just tell me he hates me and be done with it because it's so much worse watching him try to comfort Caitlin and still try to love me. Stop. Maybe you think I'm dramatic. I'm not because here's the thing. I didn't just kill my own mother. So there's plague just isn't in my house. I think about the other house a lot, and I wonder if it's just as bad there, and I bet it is. Romeo's mom hardly has any lines at all. I mean, if you've landed the part of Lady Montague in the play, if you'd like that sort of thing, you'd be pretty disappointed. She's in act one when there's this brawl, but that's it, you never see her again. Juliet's mom has tons of lines. Lady Cagula is one of those Botox and country club moms. <laughs> Juliet and her mom have issues, but she's all into making sure her daughter rocks the right look and tonight's the right guy. You can tell. I'm guessing Lady Capulet is frosty cool, but I wouldn't know because my mom wasn't like that. But Devin's mom? Devin's mom was polished in tall black boots and designer bags and drove a convertible. And Devin looks like someone out an ad for how to rock the I don't care, but I'm urban in the suburb look. Nothing matches, but it all goes. I think her mom helped her with things like that because Devin looks shaken now. Nothing matches, but it doesn't go, and I'm to blame for that too. I used to like Devin, I mean, I still like her, but I've given up on liking her because girls don't fall for guys who kill people in their family. I guess maybe it has to do with the order of things, like it's an equation, like a fall in love plus kill family member equals still true love, courtesy of William Shakespeare, although you might end up killing a buttload of people and yourself. <sighs> but if you kill a family member and then there's just too many variables and really bad odds. Mr. Thompson says he really understands Shakespeare. We need to read his comedies, too. He says it all hinges on the third act. He says the plays are kind of all the same until you get to act three, and that's where you find out it's a comedy or a tragedy. And I try to imagine what could possibly happen in act three to make Romeo and Juliet a comedy. Like, maybe instead of a sword to the gut, someone gets a pie in the face, but then I guess Mercutio wouldn't die, and maybe that's it, because then Tybalt wouldn't die, or Harris, or Romeo, or Juliet. Definitely not Romeo's mom. Act one. Devin Miller and I got paired up in freshman orientation to do this interview thing, and the tips of her hair were purple, and Devin with a Y had just gotten back from some trip to see her grandmother in Washington, and she wanted to move there someday, maybe after high school, and I didn't want to stare at the name tag on her chest like some sort of freak, so I just repeated her name in my head, Devin, 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 and I was afraid I'd forget it, because back when I didn't pay attention, but I paid attention to her, I really did. I, I was aware of her in that way that if our paths crossed on the way to gym or lunch or second period, I was like, yeah, Devin Miller, I really like her. And I caught her looking at me from time to time, and I get to look at, catch her looking, I was doing my share of looking back, but it wasn't Romeo and Juliet just shooting some sort of sick daggers at each other across the room and hanging out on the windows until all hours of the night saying crap you might not remember in the morning because that shit isn't healthy. <laughs> I kind of thought maybe when I can drive, because it made sense in my head, I'll ask Devin Miller out when I can drive, and I've always thought people who go together before they can go anywhere are kind of lame, like they're just playing around at dating, but if your parents have to pick you up and drop you off, that really doesn't count, because to me, dating requires transportation. <laughs> so when I got my permit, I had Devin Miller on my mind, and if it were a math thing, it'd be like this, driver's license plus, guts to ask out Devin Miller equals potential relationship. 
stop. I know what you're thinking. Look, I'm, I'm not Romeo thinking about Devin like she's my version of crap or whatever, and I'm not some sick stalker. I was pretty sure Devin Miller would have said yes if I'd asked her out. Act two. Late, late last year, she asked me who I was taking to homecoming. When I told her I wasn't going, she said she thought I was stupid too, but rite of passage and all that. Her mom was making her, and if I went, maybe she'd save me a dance, she said. And I thought about going, but it ended up being the same night as Caitlin's birthday, and mom told me Caitlin would understand if I missed it, but I got in my head that my middle school dance moves might actually be as goofy as Josh told me they were. The birthday party would not result in public humiliation. Josh told me I was an idiot. He said Devin Miller had given me a green light, and I hit the brakes. I'm pretty sure Devin Miller liked me back then. I wasn't paying attention, but now she hates me. I don't blame her. Act three. The day I killed our moms, I was not paying attention. I wasn't sleep deprived. I'd gotten plenty of rest the night before. People die that way, falling asleep at the wheel. People die when they text too, because phones are dangerous. But really, it all comes down to paying attention. I was paying attention to a lilac bush in full bloom instead. That shade of purple made me think about Devin Miller's hair, and I was wondering what she smelled like, and picturing her in the seat next to me instead of my mom. So I didn't see the stop sign. Mom did. She called my name and stomped her foot onto a break that wasn't in the floorboard and stretched her arm across my chest like a human seatbelt. And I didn't see her face because she was looking out the passenger window and nothing was playing on the radio because I needed quiet to see, to pay attention. But when it gets too quiet now, I hear her call my name and the screech of tires and I see red and they already know my mom is dead, my mom is dead, my mom is dead. They don't have to tell me, I know. Only she isn't the only one dead. The one in the other car is dead too, a red convertible. And later I recognize her last name, Miller. Star-crossed, not lovers. A plague on both our houses. When I get called to the guidance counselor because of my essay, she just asks me how I'm doing. I answer her questions and I try to be honest, but you know it's hard when you don't know what's true. She wants to know if I think of suicide, if I have a plan, and there's an edge to my no. I didn't mean to upset you with the question, she says. And I try to hide my disgust for her, but I can't help myself from saying, Jesus, why would I do that? Because wouldn't that screw that up for sure? I mean, hadn't I done enough? My answer seems to make the guidance counselor feel better. She wants to know if I'm going to homecoming, which is like the very last thing on my mind. My mom would say, you should go. I notice that it falls a day before Caitlin's birthday, so I need another excuse. Only why should I need an excuse? Stop. I can't go to the homecoming dance. Not after I've killed people. People who kill people should be behind bars, not attend dances. And just because people let me walk around like a not normal person doesn't mean I deserve to. And here's the worst part of it. I'm pretty sure my mom forgives me. I'm pretty sure she's perfectly okay with the fact that I killed her. I'm pretty fucking sure she wants me to be okay and go to dances, and it pisses me off her forgiving me, which is why I need Devin to keep looking at me like she can't forgive me. She's the only one who understands that I'm the plague. It makes me want to save her from having to see me. But the guidance counselor communicates with my dad, who communicates with Josh's parents, who make George Josh, Josh force me to go with his all-guy group, which is fine, I guess, because we're friends to the extent that you can be friends with anyone when you're wrecked. And because I live all two blocks from the high school, we make the decision together at my house and walk to the dance from there. And I've got a bad feeling about it. And I wish I just could hide behind the mask, but I'm already wearing one because Josh is trying too hard to make tonight okay. So I put on an act because my not being okay is not okay. I don't want to ruin everyone tonight, so I'm trying, I really am. We are greeted with loud music and an empty dance floor, and Mr. Thompson's there. He's telling us we're all lame for not dancing, and he's going to put us to shame with his moonwalking skills. <laughs> Everyone starts chanting, and he does it, and he's actually not bad. People dance, and I catch myself laughing at Josh and Martin, trying to get Mr. Thompson to teach them his moves, and they're lined up, all three of them, hunched over and looking at their feet. It's slow motion movement, out of tempo, and I slide my dress shoes across the floor to test whether I'm smooth, and I'm so not. But Mr. Thompson and Josh and Martin holler and high five anyway, and then I see her. I see Devin Miller seeing me from across the room. Stop. Pay attention. This isn't a love story. How many times do I have to tell you that this isn't a love story? We don't meet up on the dance floor. We don't press our hands against one another. Our lips never touch. It just doesn't happen. I stop laughing. I stop smiling. I mean, it's the least I can do. And then I notice Devin Miller isn't smiling either. Like maybe you think I should have a moment with her. Maybe you think I should tell her, I'm sorry. But that just goes to show how little you know about killing people. You see, that would be me making Devin Miller responsible for saying something like, it's okay, or you should be sorry, or thanks for that, or fuck you, and that's what I want. I want her to say, fuck you. I want her to give me a vial of poison or sink a dagger into me. I want to be covered in something other than other people's blood, because it's like I can't get clean. There's nothing I can do to get clean. I don't want it to stop my not smiling. 
I'm weaving through the crowd toward the door. The lady at the exit tells me I can't come back inside if I leave now. And she says it like a warning, but it's a reprieve. Being exiled? I don't bother telling Josh I'm leaving. He'll figure it out. And I'm a block from the school when I encounter the stop sign. I run my hand along its flat surface, and I touch its edges. It's cold. And I wonder how I'm going to survive this. I wonder if I'm going to survive this, because I don't think I can. And I look up at the sky, at the stars, and I think about Shakespeare. He made it seem so simple. All those people died, and not even for the reasons they think. And the families, the Montagues and Capulets, they put up a statue of Juliet and buried whatever hatchet or grief they had, like it's that easy. I stand by the stop sign in the black dress pants and shiny shoes I wore to my mom's funeral. The shirt is new. It still has creases in it from the folds. Dad said they'd fall out, but they didn't. Mom would have ironed it. But Mom's dead. It's a nice shirt. It's blue. The tie is red. I'm cold without a coat. I deserve to be cold. The ground is cold. The stop sign is cold. Hey, I yanked my hand away from the stop sign. It's Devin. Devin Miller. She's wearing a purpley sequiny dress and carrying strappy shoes, and her hair is faded to gray, and she's hugging herself with her bare arms. She's alone. She's the last person on the planet I want to see. She's the only person I can think about, and she's followed me. I fight the urge to run until I notice how cold she is in the bare feet. I mean, that's what makes me stay, the fact that she's shoeless and hugging herself, and she's cold and gray. And I brace myself for whatever is coming, and I truly hope it's bad. You left, she says. Yeah, I say. I don't say you did too, but I think it. She shivers. Why did you leave? And she says it like she knows the answer, and I should give her an answer. I mean, she deserves the answer, and I consider my options. I don't deserve to have a good time, or I didn't feel like dancing, or I saw you. And I can't figure out anything to say that won't force her to do something or say something to make me feel better. I don't blame you for hating me. And there it is, the perfect thing to say. I don't blame you for hating me. Only, I'm not saying it. She is. She is saying it to me. Devin Miller thinks I hate her. I can barely get the words out. I don't hate you. And my words are so true, it hurts to say them. I'm crying. She's made me fucking cry. Why would you think that? Because my mom, my mom crashed into you. My mom, and Devin is literally insane. She must be insane. She's rattling about her mom's speeding ticket and how awful it is and how sorry she is, and we're both crying. How did she not know it's my fault? I'm telling her I missed the stop sign. I'm telling her it's me, it's my fault, because it is my fault. And I'm telling her, but she's wrapping me in her arms, and I can't let her comfort me, and I want to tell her to stop, but she needs comforting, and I can't deny her anything, because we are plagued and star-crossed. Stop. It doesn't seem possible, but it might be a love story. I don't know if it's happily ever after, or forever, or eternal, or if I even believe in those things, but for a second, standing by the stop sign, it's the best love story ever told. <laughs>